Grade 11s, welcome. It's that time of the year, exams and all that tension. But what's the best way to prepare, guys? Yes, to go through some past papers. So today we're looking at revision, and that's for Paper 1, Life Sciences. So I hope you guys are in the mood of preparing. Are you busy with working with your notes and solving questions? I think that's the best approach at this time of the year. Let's get straight into Paper 1, Revision for Life Sciences. And I think before we get into that, we've got to look at, and you've got to look at it as well, in terms of what is the difference between Paper 1 and Paper 2, and what are the strands or what are the topics that are covered in Paper 1. So I'm going to do a very overall recap in terms of what we've done since the beginning of the year that are in Paper 1, and then over the next couple of weeks, we will look at Paper 2 as well. So let's get straight into it, Grade 11s. Right, so what are the, some of the topics that we've covered thus far in Paper 1? So we've looked at transformation of energy, and that's through the process of photosynthesis. We've also looked at the process of animal nutrition, and we looked at recently, we looked at the process of respiration, how energy from photosynthesis is converted in the process of respiration. So we've got to look at these three strands or three topics today, and in each one, we're going to go through each section, we're going to have an overview of each topic, and then we're going to try and recollect some of the terminology. I'll give you a short segment to work through some of the terms, and then when we get back, look at these answers and possibly then look at some of some longer questions. So let's look at energy transformation to sustain life. And essentially what we're looking at is the process of photosynthesis. And very quickly, we've got to remember, we've got to look at the location or the site of photosynthesis as well as the structure in which photosynthesis occurs. So we are looking at the process of photosynthesis in the chloroplast. Here we look at uh, the organelle, and the organelle that we're referring to here in this case is the um, chloroplast. And when we look at the chloroplast, it's very important for you to be able to identify the different parts and the, 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 the parts in which the process of photosynthesis occur. It's also important for you to be able to recognize the electron micrograph of that organelle. So you should be able to identify the parts of a chloroplast as well as be able to identify the organelle by its shape and its typical thylakoid arrangement that we see. Also, we've got to know in terms of how the leaf is a mod, is a is an organ that is adapted for the process of photosynthesis, and we look at the cells which are highly specialized to photosynth photosynthesize, and that is because of a large concentration of chloroplast. Cool. That's sort of an overview of what we've been looking at in terms of the organelle in which photosynthesis occurs. Let's look at the concept around how photosynthesis occurs, and if you recollect from our previous lessons and from the work that you've done at school, we know that photosynthesis occurs in two stages. We know that we have the light-dependent phase and we have the light-independent phase. And in the light-dependent phase, essentially we need sunlight, and sunlight is able to use water and carbon dioxide and convert that, uh, uh, use water and break down the water molecules into hydrogen atoms, which are then transferred into the next step of the light independent phase and some of you would be familiar with the term the Calvin cycle. In the Calvin cycle we see what occurs is that the production of C6H12O6 which is glucose that occurs and the release of that glucose with the production of water and oxygen as a waste product being released. So we've got to remember the equation for photosynthesis when we getting into our exams. So guys what I will do in this session is I'll very quickly go through um, some of these statements and descriptions and we, I'll describe them and I'll give you an opportunity to, to jot down some of these answers quickly so that we can look at them when we get back after two minutes. So let me read through these questions or these statements so that you can fill these terms in very quickly as, an, as a revision and then let's check then if you are correct. So the first statement is raw materials required for photosynthesis. So you've got to know these. You can either learn them through an equation or just know them in terms of what goes into the process and what is produced at the end. The second term is the process during photosynthesis when water molecules are split up into hydrogen and water. Okay, into hydrogen and water. The third process is the form in which excess glucose is stored in plants. That's very important. The fourth statement is the reagent used to test for the presence of starch. And that reagent would be something that you'd be very familiar with from grade 10. And then obviously the fifth 
term that we need to answer is the energy carrier that takes chemical energy to the dark phase of photosynthesis. So guys, I think five simple but yet very important terms. I'll give you two minutes. Look at these and come up with what you think is the most correct term or description of for these descriptions. Two minutes, guys, and then I'll see you then. So guys, I'm sure that was not that difficult. So let's look at these answers. So I know that there was a question, there was a problem with this statement, but I'll very quickly correct that when we get to it. it might sound a little bit confusing, but yeah. Uh, what happens to the process during which when water molecules are split up into hydrogen and, and that the term there would be hydrogen and oxygen, so it'll be O2. Let's look at these answers very quickly. So the raw materials required for photosynthesis, guys. And we know that during the process of photosynthesis, you need light, you need carbon dioxide, and you need water. So you're going to need to have all three components for the process to occur. Let's look at the next step. The next step was the process during photosynthesis when water molecules are split up into hydrogen and oxygen. And that was very simple. And that is when, remember, when water is split up, it's hydrolysis. But here we're using, using light. And hence, light is the photo and then lysis would be the splitting up of the water. So the process we're referring to here is photolysis, and essentially that is when the water molecule is split up into hydrogen and oxygen molecules. The third term was the form in which excess glucose is stored. So what happens to excess glucose in the plant? Guys, that excess glucose makes the plant cell, uh, changes the water potential of the plant cell, and hence in order for the plant to be able to store glucose, it needs to convert it into a form that is inactive, which does not affect the solute potential or the water potential of a cell. And often what happens is that plants store the glucose uh, as a re reserve energy molecule in the form of starch. And that is why we know that potatoes are rich in starch, and often the seeds and the uh, roots that are used as storage molecules in plants contain a high amount of starch. So quite an interesting question, and that will help you remember why glucose is stored as starch. Number four, the reagent which is used to test for the presence of starch. Now this guy's come, I'm sure you remember this from grade eight, 10, and that's iodine. So we have used iodine, and iodine gives you a color which is ch changes from yellow to uh, a dark blue slash violet or blackish color. So it could change from blue to yellow to black, and that is the indication of a positive test for the presence of starch. And then finally, the fifth question was the energy carrier that takes chemical energy 
into the dark energy during photosynthesis. And this question will come up again. And we know that the energy carrier molecule in the cell is the ATP molecule. So when we refer to ATP, guys, we're referring to adenosine triphosphate. So that was quite an interesting question. Just to recap on the important concepts in photosynthesis. Guys, I'm going to get straight through to a question which we've looked at in the past, but we haven't had a chance to actually complete this. But I think it's a very good question looking at your exam prep. I'm going to read through this again. And for those of you that have worked on this before, I think you're going to benefit from having done this. It's an excellent question to actually get in, in, in part of your revision practice for your exam. So the question reads, an investigation was conducted to determine the relationship between light and the release of carbon dioxide by the leaves of plants grown in a sunny and in a shady area. So we're looking at an experiment to determine the relationship between light, release of carbon dioxide in the leaves of plants in both grown in a shady and sunny area. The results are indicated in the graph below. So here we find the results on the graph below. Study the graph and answer the questions that follow. Quite interesting. Let's see. So here's a graph that shows the change of net carbon dioxide, guys. And remember, as I always say, remember to read the heading. So it talks about a change of the net carbon dioxide uptake with light intensity. And on this, we've got two lines that are indicated using two different colors. And the blue line refers to a plant that is grown in a sunny place. So here we've got sunshine, and that plant enjoys the sun. And here we've got a plant that is grown in a shady area, so this would be something that is, you know, conducive to partial sunlight, and hence we know that plants are adapted for living in different conditions, and that will affect the rate of photosynthesis depending on the light intensity. And here we have, on the y-axis, we've got the net carbon dioxide intake in an arbitrary unit, and here on the x-axis, we can see the value of zero. And then we're seeing the light intensity on the x-axis, which is then which is then the independent variable. Let's look at some of the questions that are related to this. Okay, so also there is another graph relating to this. What intensity of light drive photosynthesis? And guys, this is very important for, you, for us to understand. What I've done is I've put this graph in intentionally before we get to a question. Here we're looking at a graph in which we find the relationship between photosynthesis, we're looking at photosynthesis, and we're looking at what happens in respiration. And we know that the association between respiration and photosynthesis in a plant can establish a point where the amount of products produced by respiration will be sufficient for or balances out the amount of products required by the organelle, chloroplast, for photosynthesis. And we get to that point where the amount of carbon dioxide produced by the, mi by the mitochondria is equal to the amount of carbon dioxide utilized by the, uh, by the chloroplast. And hence, we refer to this point as the compensation point. And I think before we get into this question, it's important for you to understand that it is a point where it breaks even. And at this point, the, we, have an, we have the rate of respiration and the rate of photosynthesis being somewhat equal. Having said that, let's get back to the question. And I think this concept will definitely be of help when looking at the question or these questions. So the first question would be, at what range of light intensity is carbon dioxide released in plants that are grown in the sunny and shady area. So again, we've got to look at the range of light intensity. When you have a question that refers to a range, a range is always between two points. So we've got to look at from where to where. So we've got to look at, at what range is the carbon dioxide released in plants that are grown in the sunny area. So I'm going to click on the answer so that we can go back. It's In the sunny, it's between five units, sorry, and in the shady, it's between eight units. So let's get back to that graph very quickly so that we can see how we've come to that. So the range in, so here we're seeing clearly that the range in plants that are grown in sunny and shady areas varies from between five, you can see here, and 10 units. And how was that achieved? So let's go back and we will see that it is an establishment based on looking at the trend in the graph. So again, the range of light intensity and the carbon dioxide in plants that are grown in sunny areas. And we say that it's between minus five units there and eight units on that. So let me just read that value again. So again, minus five units here, you can clearly see here, it starts off here from around minus five units. 
to between around eight units up there. Okay, and that is the range at which it is. Cool, so let's get on to the next question and let's see what that has in store for us. 2.2, .2. name the process taking place in the leaves which uses carbon dioxide. Now guys, we know that plants photosynthesize in the presence of carbon dioxide. That was quite an easy question and an easy mark to get. Why is, why is most carbon dioxide released when the light intensity is zero? And essentially that question is, so why do plants produce lots of carbon dioxide when there's no light? And remember that the essential process of respiration will continuously occur. So regardless of the time of the day, plants will produce carbon dioxide. But at night, when there is no light for photosynthesis, the plants will tend to continue for respiration and hence produce carbon dioxide. So we know that there is no photosynthesis occurring in the plant during the dark or during the absence of light. And this is when respiration releases carbon dioxide and hence you could test for the presence of carbon dioxide occurring at night and that's purely because of respiration that continues to occur. 2.4 How much carbon dioxide is taken up by the leaves grown in the sun when the light intensity is 60 units? So we've got to look at when the light intensity is 60 units, how much of carbon dioxide is taken up. So guys, remember we're looking at plants that are grown in the sun so and the answer there for that is 20 units but it's important for you to understand how that extrapolation occurred okay so I'm going to click back to the graph so that we can see what happens at 20 units so here at 20 units let's go through this again so we're looking at mm, so I'm, I'm just going to recap on the question it's a bit difficult for me to recollect the question now but I think it's, it does help when the questions are next to the graph. So again, I'm just going to read this for the benefit of myself and so that you're clear with this. How much of carbon dioxide? So we're looking at the amount of carbon dioxide is taken up by leaves grown in the sun when the light intensity is 60 units. So we're looking at leaves grown in the sun when the light intensity is 60 units. So we've got to look at which graph. So we're looking at the light intensity being 60 units. And when we look at 60 units, how much of carbon dioxide is taken up? So guys, we've got to go plot up straight here, and we've got to extrapolate there. So that's about 20 units. So we're looking at, the important thing is to remember that it refers to plants that are grown in sunlight. Cool. So again, simple question requiring a bit of extrapolation from the graph. 2.5. When the light intensity is approximately 10 units, so again, we've got to go back to the graph. So when the light intensity is 10 units, there is no net change in the concentration of carbon dioxide during surrounding the plant grown in the sunny area. Give an explanation for this. I tried to explain this early on. And what I said was that the amount of carbon dioxide in this case given off is equal to the amount of carbon dioxide taken in by the leaves during photosynthesis. And hence that point is referred to as a compensation point. And that essentially refers to the point when the rate of respiration and photosynthesis are very much equal. Guys, before we take a short break, I'm just going to very quickly go through the last question and then we have a little stretch break, break for you guys. 2.6. At light intensity above 25 units, in plants grown in shady areas, the amount of carbon dioxide remains the same. Suggest an explanation for this observation. So essentially what happens at a point when the carbon dioxide content increases? What's going to, what, what does it tell you? And it remains constant after a little while. It tells you that it has probably, probably reached a point where any further increase in light intensity will not affect the rate of photosynthesis. So if we read through this here, we know that the plant has reached its maximum rate of photosynthesis. It has a specific concentration of chloroplast after which any further increase in the amount of light will not be absorbed and hence it will not increase the concentration any further. And hence we say that it has reached a maximum or a constant rate. Also plants that are grown in shade have a fewer or shady areas have fewer chloroplast in their leaves than plants that are adapted to growing in sunny areas and hence you'll see that plants that are grown in shady areas tend to have a, a lower rate of photosynthesis as compared to a plant that is growing in a bright sunny area. So guys, 
We looked at photosynthesis in this session. I think we go for a little stretch break, and when we get back, we will tackle more questions with the exam for paper one. Grade 11s, welcome back. So let's look at a new topic. You know that we've done photosynthesis. There are lots of questions that you might have. Go back, look at your notes, look at some other questions as well. Best way to revise is look at questions. So the next topic we're looking at is nutrition. And in terms of nutrition, we know that plants have produced the glucose. Plants have produced the organic material. Now we're looking at how that organic material is used by organisms for the pro during the process of nutrition. So essentially we're looking at nutrition as a process. We're going to answer some questions around this, but I think it's very important for you to remember and recollect the parts of the digestive system and the processes that are involved in terms of the process of ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation, and then ejection of it. So those five processes you should definitely know. Try and learn the glands that secrete enzymes or the organs that are producing secretions that are part of the digestive system. Look at what happens during the process of absorption. Those are important processes. I think it's very important for us to remember also the cross-section and the adaptation of the small intestine to make the process effective. So some subtle hints there in terms of as you prepare for your exams. So let's look at some questions relating to um, the process of nutrition. So I've got some rapid fire questions for you. This is round two. I'm going to read through these and I'm going to give you another two minutes for you guys to have a discussion with your friends and to write down some of these answers. So the statement of the des description that is given for number one. The process in nutrition when food is changed from insoluble to soluble substances using enzymes. Number two. The process in nutrition when undigested remains are removed from the body. Number three refers to cells in the pancreas which secrete insulin and glucagon. And these are the two hormones that we need to refer to. And then we look at number four, which is the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the muscles in the wall of the alimentary canal that helps to move food particles forward. And the fifth one will be a form of malnutrition due to the lack of protein. So guys, I've read through these des descriptions. I'm going to give you guys two minutes, some easy ones here, to very quickly jot down your answers. If you're not too sure with the, about these terms, have a quick discussion with your friends. Open to your books, to your textbooks, and po possibly write down these answers before we get back. So two minutes, guys. Let's get cracking. Welcome back guys. I don't think that was very difficult. 
So let's look at what you've come up with and let's see. I'm sure you've got most of these very accessible. But again, as I said, it's important to go through terminology at the start when you're practicing for an exam. So the first question was the process that refers to changing insoluble so substances to soluble substances using enzymes. And we know that that is a process known as chemical digestion. We also must remember the process of physically breaking down food particles without chemicals is known as uh, physical digestion. Um, and it's, an, it's a term that often you need to be able to differentiate by the fact that enzymes can be used, whereas the other is more physical process and that occurs in terms of chewing of food. The next term was process in nutrition when undigested remains are removed from the body. And that occurs to a process what we know as egestion. So remember that egestion is not excretion because often in the process of excretion is waste products. Egestion is both containing waste products and containing products that have not been able to digest or undigestible products, example cellulose. So it's not a waste product, but it is something that the body is not able to process and digest, which is then egested from the body. The third term was that we needed to find was the cells in the pancreas which secrete the hormones insulin and glucagon. And guys, if you remember, the pancreas was both an endocrine and exocrine gland. And remember that the exocrine function was releasing the pancreatic juices via the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. But the endocrine function of the pancreas was, and in terms of maintaining blood sugar levels, was the fact that it was able to release insulin and glucagon. And for that, we refer to the islets of Langerhans, which are these patches of cells made up of alpha and beta cells that produce both these hormones insulin and glucagon, which are fundamentally important in maintaining homeostasis and again the balance of blood sugar levels in the body. Um, important to remember the step in terms of the control mechanisms that we talk of maintaining a normal condition or homeostasis and in that condition it was the negative feedback between insulin and glucagon. Number four, the rhythmic contractions and relaxations of the muscles in the walls of the alimentary canal that helped to move food particles forward. And guys, this was very accessible. Remember that peristalsis is what helps to propel food along, and that is the contraction and relaxation of the circular and longitudinal muscles along the entire alimentary canal. And then finally, the fifth description was a form of malnutrition. And guys, if you recollect malnutrition, remember that we looked at different types of malnutrition, but in this case, because it's a lack of protein, Often we get learners that mistaken or confuse themselves with a disorder or malnutrition. Remember, malnutrition refers to uh, a person that does not have a balanced diet. And in this case, a person lacks protein. And we know that individuals that lack protein in their diet um, contain, uh, have a disease called, have a condition known as kwashioka. <clears throat> so go through the rest of your terms. Kwashioka, marasmus, obesity, malnutrition, um, anorexia. Uh, bulimia. Those are important terms. So create a terminology list, use that. It's very important to be able to differentiate between them. Often it gets confusing, especially when you don't know them. So a good takeaway would be go and create a list of those different malnutrition disorders that you are familiar with. We're going to look at a longer question in the segment as well. The following experiment was set up to test the effect of different pH values on the activity of protein digesting enzymes which are normally found in the stomach of humans. Remember that the stomach is an area that has an acidic pH range and by that I think it will help us to understand what the effect of that pH value will have in an acidic range. Equal amounts of egg white which is a protein and solutions of different pH values were placed in each of the four test tubes. Let's look at how this experiment was set up. Here we have all the test tubes that we kept in a water bath at a constant temperature. And we've got test tubes A, B, and C, C and D labeled. A is kept at a pH of 2. pH 7 was in which test tube B was. And pH 8 was in test tube C. And pH 11 in test tube D. Note that each of these test tubes contained different substances. In the first test tube, you had 2 cm cubed of enzyme. In test tube B, you had an enzyme. In test tube C, you had enzymes. And in the, third, in the fourth test tube, pardon me, we had the boiled enzyme. And the other thing that you've got to note is that these pH ranges were not 
the same. So that is obviously something that you're going to look at and remember that in terms of when interpreting the questions. So let's look at these questions. So 3.1. If 2 cm cubed of enzyme was added to test tube A, how much of enzyme must be added to test tubes B and C? Give a reason for your answer. If we go back guys, in, the, in, in, in order to maintain a control variable, here we've just got 2 cm cubed of enzyme. How do we make this experiment fair, reliable and controlled? The best way to do that is to ensure that the same volume or the same amount of enzyme is added to each of those remaining three test tubes. And in this case, we've got to add 2 cm cubed of enzyme into B, C and D respectively. But the only difference is that in D, we would have had to boil the enzyme and then add it in. And what will be the reason for that? The reason for that is we've got to maintain the variable, in this case, which is controlled, and we keep the variable controlled so that it makes the experiment fair and reliable, and it allows us to be able to draw a scientific conclusion based on not the difference in the amount of the enzymes, but rather the difference in the pH of the solutions in which those enzymes worked. 3.2. In which test tube would you expect the egg white to be digested the fastest. So we're looking at, we've got to identify in which of these test tubes will the egg white be digested the fastest. And the second part of that question is explain your answer. Guys, I think if you think of where this is occurring, remember that proteins are normally digested in the stomach. And for proteins, the enzyme that digests stomach would be the proteases. And these are normally have an optimum pH in the stomach around two to around four or five. And that means that range is an acidic range. So if we go back to those test tubes, remember the range of test tubes we kept at different pHs. So we've got to identify in which the reaction would occur the most favorable. So pH 2 is an acidic pH, pH 7 is neutral, pH 8 is alkaline, and pH 11 is also alkaline. So we would expect the reaction to occur in, pH, in test tube A the fastest, and that is purely because it is a pH in which the range of the enzyme normally is its optimal range. So again, as I said, it's test tube A, and this is the ideal pH for the enzymes that work on proteins in the stomach. Other test tubes have a pH range that will not allow the protein digesting enzymes to function optimally, as it normally functions between 2 to 4, 4.5 in terms of the pH scale. D has the enzyme, but it has the enzyme which has been denatured. And this means that when the enzyme is denatured, regardless of the optimum pH, the enzyme will not be able to function and carry out the process of breaking down the protein into the polypeptide chains. 3.3. Discuss the food test that you would conduct on the egg white to prove that it contained protein. Again, recollection from grade 10, you've got to know that there's a glucose test, there's a protein test, as well as there's a lipid test. So in this case, we've got to find the test that actually will test for the presence of proteins. So we've got to identify the reagent. And in this case, case the reagent is the biuret test. I know some schools um, do have these investigations or experiments that have done, and learners have worked with these. And these are two solutions that you mix. You get biurets A and B, and these combinations produce a blue color. So the proteins in the presence of a biuret reagent turns blue. And when proteins are present in a substance or in a solution, due to the presence of the biuret reagent, the blue color, when treated, when those test tubes are treated with a little uh, uh, water in a water bath around 45 degrees Celsius, will turn to a purple or a lilac color. And that intensity of the purple or the tinge of the purple indicates the concentration of protein. So if you were to compare the different intensities of purple, you would be able to confirm in terms of quantitatively that there is relatively more proteins in solutions that turn darker purple in color as opposed to solutions that have a tinge or a lilac color. So quite a good method to test in terms of the concentrations of proteins more at a qualitative rev level rather than at a quantitative level. Okay, guys. 3.4. A temperature at temperature would, sorry, I think it should read at what temperature, so I'm going to correct this question for us. At what 
temperature, would you keep the water bath? Give a reason for your answer. And I think that's important for us. Remember that these are enzymes that probably will function optimally at optimum body temperature. So looking at the context of this, I would assume that at 37 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, a temperature range of that would be ideal for most enzymes to function that are normally functioning in the range of a human enzyme. So again, as I said, it's between 37 to 40 degrees Celsius. And the motivation for that was that these and these or this body temperature in terms of that humans function is around that and hence the enzyme should be placed in a temperature around that which creates an optimum temperature range for the activity of the enzyme. 3.5 How would the experiment be affected if you added a few drops of concentrated sodium hydroxide to test tube A? Now guys remember that sodium hydroxide Sodium hydroxide, I'm not a very good uh, chemistry teacher, but sodium hydroxide is NaOH. And NaOH is an alkaline substance or is a base substance. And you know that in the stomach, the, the medium is acidic. And hence, here we're adding now an acidic. Here we have a test tube, which has got a pH of 2. And now we add a base to that. It's going to affect the pH here. It's going to alter the optimum pH range, which will mean that the, the effective range at which the enzyme can work has now been changed. And that's going to affect the way the enzyme functions. So the concentration of sodium hydroxide is a concentrated sodium hydroxide, guys, is a strong alkaline substance, which means that it's a base, which will affect the pH of test tube A. By that effect, we mean it will change the optimum pH range, causing it to change from pH 2 to probably around 4 or 5 or even further up. This will mean that it affects the optimum pH range for the enzyme and it will slow down or even stop the reaction as the optimum pH range has now been altered by adding the strong base into that. So guys, that takes us to the end of this question. There is one more. I think I'll have a go at it and then we will look at having a break and then some more questions in the last segment. So 3.6. Would you expect a positive test for protein in test tube D? Explain. So guys, if you go back to that question, test tube D was a test tube in which we had the enzyme, but the enzyme was boiled. And with boiling, we know that any enzyme, when boiled, because it's protein in nature, will denature. And by denature, I mean that the enzyme will not be able to carry out its functioning again. So if we have the enzyme boiled and it's denatured, can we test for the presence of protein? what will we get? Let's look at the answer for that question. So guys, essentially what's going to happen is that, remember that a change in the, in the, the enzyme temperature affects it. So protein test will be positive, And that means that the protein that we have, the egg white, remains unchanged. So when we test for proteins in the presence of biuret, you'll find that because the protein, because the enzyme has digested, it will not affect the protein and hence it will not digest the protein and will still be present in an inactive form or in a denatured form. And that can be tested positive for using the reagent. So a little tricky question, but you've got to understand the context of how the, PA, the temperature would have affected the optimum functioning of that enzyme when it was boiled. So guys, a quick stretch break. And when we get back, we're looking at the third strand in this paper one, which is respiration. Guys, again, the last segment, but in this segment, we're going to look at some of the topics that you've done more recently. And again, this is respiration, as I said, and a very quick overall view of respiration. You've got to re learn both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And what is important to remember is that respiration consists of three stages. And we know that the first stage occurs when glucose is broken up in the cytoplasm. And here we can clearly see the cytoplasm. So if I drew a mitochondria around this, that, that would be where the mitochondria is. So here we see glucose undergoing what we call the process known as glycolysis, stage one, to be converted to pyruvate acid. And then that enters the mitochondria, which undergoes the next step of uh, the Krebs cycle in which ATP is produced. And then it goes into the last stage, which is known as the electron transport chain, or guys, the oxidative phosphorylation. And here we see the addition of phosphate by the energy that comes from the hydrogen atoms to adenosine diphosphate and that ADP 
plus the phosphate with the help of the energy from the electron transfer chain gives you ATP. And this ATP is the energy carrier molecule, which is, the, which is what happens at the end of uh, respiration. We also know that respiration requires oxygen to take place. And in the absence of oxygen, we get what we know as anaerobic respiration. And that can occur, or it's also called fermentation, and that can occur both in plants and in animals. And in plants, it produces what we know as ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. However, in animals, it undergoes a process which is known as lactic acid fermentation, which is a buildup of lactic acid in the, in the muscles. This is a process that produces only two molecules of ATP, and it is a process that, that occurs in the absence of oxygen, and hence it only releases little energy and ensures that the process of respiration continues, however, at not a very successful level. And we know that the uses of this process in terms of industry have massive implications in terms of how baking of bread, brewing of, um, in the brewing industry, and even in biotechnology in terms of producing useful substances for the consumption by humans. So again, let's look at some statements and descriptions, uh, and let's see if you guys can work through them. I'll, I'll probably give you this time, I think I'll give you a minute so you can get through these and tackle some more questions. So I'm gonna read through these and give you a minute to put in as many as you can before I give you the answers. So the first description is the process in the body cells during which organic compounds are broken down with the gradual release of energy. Number two, the phase in cellular respiration when glucose is broken down to pyruvic acid. Number three, the use of living organisms in industrial processes such as food processing. Number four, the liquid that becomes cloudy in the presence of carbon dioxide. And number five, a series of cyclic reactions during cellular respiration when energy-rich hydrogen atoms and carbon dioxide are, is released. So guys, one short, quick minute. I want you guys to jot down your answers, have a brief, quick discussion, and we we'll look at these statements at the end of a minute. Well, that's why it's called rapid fire questions, guys. I want you guys to think fast, come up with these answers. So let's get straight into the answers. So the first one was the process in the body cells during which organic compounds are broken down to gradually release energy. And that we know we discussed, and that was cellular respiration. And we know that there are two stage, two types of cellular respiration. And in, in cellular respiration that occurs anaerobically, there are three stages. Let's look at the next question. The phase in cellular respiration when glucose is broken down to pyruvic acid and we looked at that and we said that that was glycolysis and remember glycolysis refers to the breakdown of glucose the splitting up and hence the word glycolysis so important to remember let's look at number three the use of living organisms in the industrial process such as food processing we know that lots of microorganisms lots of yeast and bacteria have been used in industrial processes but we also know that Lots of these can be used in processes for the benefit of producing useful products that can be used for human consumption. And this process is referred to as biotechnology. And again, if we break this term down, bio meaning living things, and technology is a process that results in producing things that can be used by humans either for consumption or in terms of sustaining their, their livelihoods. Number four, the liquid that becomes cloudy in the presence of carbon dioxide. So this will be something that will be used to test for the presence of carbon dioxide. 
So often in an experimental design question, you would be asked, what will be the color change when carbon dioxide uh, uh, mixes with this solution? We know that lime water in the presence of carbon dioxide will turn milky white, and that is often a positive test for the presence of carbon dioxide. And then number five was a series of cyclic reactions during cellular respiration when energy-rich hydrogen atoms and carbon dioxide are released. And that is the last stage in which the energy is, the second stage in which the energy is gradually released in a cyclic event. And that is the key word, is that it's a cyclic stage of re reaction. And we saw that during the Krebs cycle, energy was produced in hydrogen atoms. And that was when the pyruvic acid molecule underwent, or acetyl-CoA underwent a series of steps which gradually released carbon dioxide which, sorry, which release the de-energized oxygen molecules and produce carbon dioxide and also led to the production of ATP. So that was very quickly some rapid fire questions on respiration. I've got this question here. We'll try and work through it. It's, we're almost at the end of the segment, but I think I'll give you an overview of the questions so that you can use these in the exam. So the diagram below represents the apparatus that was used in a practical investigation. After a period of 24 hours, red hydrogen carbonate indicator was added to each test tube. What is important is that the red hydrogen carbonate indicator turns yellow in the presence of carbon dioxide. So here's another test where red hydrogen carbonate turns yellow in the presence of carbon dioxide. The other, the other agent that we just discussed now was um, lime water, which turns murky white. Here we've got something that gives you a more defined, more distinct color presence which indicates the, carbon, the presence of carbon dioxide. So in this experiment, you've got a test tube, and in test tube A, you can see that it's test tube A with water, and that's just water. Test tube B has got a water plant, and it's a hydrophyte, which is present in there. And test tube C, we've got a snail. And looking at these three test tubes, this would be a control, because it has nothing in it. And test tube B and test tube C have both a plant, and that is for the process of photosynthesis and C, the snail has been put in there for the process of respiration. What is important to note that all these test tubes are placed in, in a dark room. And the essential reason for this is to check and to determine and to eliminate the factor of light which will affect the rate of photosynthesis. So you've got to remember that it's kept in light because we don't want photosynthesis to take place. And all we want to see is the effect of respiration. So what would occur guys? Think about it. Here you've got, a, you've got a plant that is present in water and it's it's kept in a period over a period of time in a dark room. Will respiration occur? Definitely. Remember that plants also have mitochondria and the process of respiration will definitely occur in this. A snail again guys is an organism that will produce uh, uh, will produce energy and that energy is produced in the cells through a process of respiration. So we know that respiration is going to occur both in plants and in the snail. So that means the red carbon, red or hydrogen carbonate solution will turn yellow in both these indicating the presence of um, carbon dioxide. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of in, in, in closing, I would say look at these questions, uh, go back to your notes, uh, build up your vocabulary. If you have not made notes guys, I think it's important that you need to prepare notes Read, your, read through your notes, answer some exam questions, look at your solutions, and all the best for your exams.